Hi, my name is Tracy Takahama Espinosa, and this is a video on nutrition and its impact on learning outcomes. So the number one question probably jumping out at all of you is, is there a perfect diet for your brain? Well, there's a whole lot of books out there that would make you think it's so. Um, I'm just going to give you kind of a, a, a quick, a shorter version of, of the answer. Just think about it. Your brain is an organ. What's another important organ in your body? Your heart. So just basic rule of thumb. Best diet for your brain, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Just think about it that way. This will not keep the popular press from offering a whole lot of suggestions about the best diet for your brain. So there are a lot of things that are out there and because they're in print, we believe them. And many of them come from reputable sources. So we really have to be careful of the claims. For example, we know that diet is one of those things that has so many convoluting factors to it. So we know in general that people who eat well also tend to have a whole lot of other healthy habits. So is it what they're eating or is it their other habits that actually benefit that individual? We know that certain things in your diet can influence depression, for example. But is it the fact that you are eating X food or because you are doing the Mediterranean diet like the Mediterraneans and cooking with your neighbors and enjoying uh, your food that actually changes your depressive state. So we have to be very careful when we break this down. What is actually happening in the body, in the brain, based on the nutrients that we're taking in? There are a lot of claims that have to do with things like um, fish and omega-3s and yogurt and sauerkraut and uh, green tea and other antioxidant fruits. Nobody argues that those things could be bad for you. But do they really have this promise of um, staving off, for example, certain diseases? Or are certain claims, for example, that the Western diet shrinks uh, the left hippocampus and so um, certain foods like that, are those more alarmist things? I would have to say that if you have a study um, that's done over four years, that sounds pretty good. But if it's only 255 participants when you have billions of people in the world with different types of dietary needs, it might be questionable. So we have to take this into consideration but not sort of live and die by it. One thing that might be really good, though, is if you look across diets, if you look at the Mediterranean diet and the Okinawan diet and the Scandinavian diet, and you see all across the board that all of them recommend uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fish, lean meats in moderation, olive oil, a little bit of red wine, then if you see that recommended all across the board, there might be something to that. So I think you should be cautious consumers of the information that's available. Most things, if you read these articles very carefully, you'll see that they're worded in such a way that they sort of relieve the person of any kind of responsibility. If you say that the Mediterranean diet may actually help preserve neuronal connections in the brain, that word may really saves you because we don't know yet. We really just don't know yet. So something may help slow the decline of Alzheimer's, definitely worth looking into. But remember that none of these things have been proven yet. Had they been proven, we would all be under the same kind of dietary recommendations, right? I really like uh, this particular uh, video presentation because it does have that cautious optimism about it that tells you some really good information but also the things that we need to worry about. So, I, so let's have a look. The one thing that we can say for sure across the board, no question about it, is that getting your nutrients from food is much better than just taking a pill. So supplements are good and interesting and when you have no other options, that's great. However, if you have the option, you're far better off consuming the nutrients through real food. Uh, rule of thumb is, you know, closest to the source as possible. And there's also a whole new field that I hope many of you look into that has to do with nutritional psychiatry. This is, is a booming new area that seems to come and go in waves of like every 50 years we become interested in the foods we eat once again. Nowadays, there is even uh, more interest in this because of a food security. How do you get your foods from around the world? Nowadays people have a, a lot of access to a lot of different types of foods. Uh, what's better? Adding chia or adding walnuts to your cereal. There's a lot of options out there so there's a lot of comparative studies that are now back in uh, favor and popularity. But one of the bigger angles to this is um, food and mood. So basically how is what you're consuming, the nutrients that you eat, how does that influence your mental state. Could you leverage good nutrients to move out of depressive states? Could you leverage good eating habits to improve your general health and well-being and therefore your ability to perform in life? Final really interesting point that I hope you will all reflect on deeply is to consider, you know, what is the perfect diet given cultural 
boundaries. Uh, before in the United States, we used to have this food pyramid, which was really interesting. It had a very, you know, clear space there for uh, lots of dairy products and, and even a small space for saturated fats and even processed oils and things like that. A couple years ago in the School of Public Health, Harvard challenged that and actually came out with a different structure. It was called the healthy eating plate. And they basically recommended about half of our intake should be vegetables and fruits, which is very interesting because in the old pyramid, they were actually together, fruits and vegetables, right? Then they suggest whole grains. And rather than uh, prescribing a certain type of meat, they basically say, no, you need some healthy proteins. So whether or not that's something in a vegetarian diet with tofu, for example, as opposed to um, chicken or beef, it's basically just recommended as being a healthy protein, which is very interesting, right? And if you look at other types of food pyramids from Japan, or China, you'll see that most of the foods are very reflective of the cultures. People used to be bound principally by what they had access to. Nowadays, with uh, international commerce, people can get pretty much uh, anything in most big cities around the world. So you now have a choice, and this means making big decisions about what types of whole grains you're going to eat, or what types of healthy proteins are really the most optimal for you. Again, though, looking at the commonalities um, amongst all of the recommended diets in different parts of the world, that might be a good indicator. For example, absolutely all of them recommend that there be a high amount of, of grains and fruits and vegetables. That's in everybody's diet around the world, so maybe there's something to that. Finally, remember that all of this should be taken into consideration based on human variability. For example, frequency of meals, uh, general metabolism. How many of you, for example, would like to eat two big meals a day? And how many of you would love to eat uh, eight little smaller meals a day? Um, those are really important things to take into consideration because different people's bodies process things in different ways. Culturally based norms are one thing, but also how the individual human body reacts to different dietary stimulus, different dietary needs. Another thing to take into consideration with human variability is that different people will react differently to different nutrients based on genetic makeup. Some of you might have a peanut allergy or have um, problems with dairy products and others of you might um, go into a deep depressive state if you eat wheat. Different people have different reactions to different nutrients. So anybody who generically says this is the perfect diet, be very wary of those things, okay? As always, we want you to think about the risk and protective factors that are in your life related to your nutrition. Are you the kind of person who has a, a risk factor because uh, you have no time? to eat and you're eating a lot of junk food or you're eating your meals at your desk or you have a protective factor because uh, every Wednesday and Sunday night you know the family comes over and everybody cooks together and you enjoy slow food or you have a garden in your house and you're protected by the fact that you know that your food is coming straight from the source. Whatever it may be, the risk and protective factors are very real in our life related to nutrition and they do have an impact on our potential to learn. So think about those things and I look forward to all your questions when we meet up. Thanks a lot.